So Alexis is a female INTJ in the MBTI community. And I had subscribed, I saw her stuff, I put it on the watch later list. I was like, I'm gonna get to this. And I always like what I consider newer people to myself because I really think that it's important to see not just every perspective's perspective on the types, but also like various INTJ perspectives on how they see the types. And the video that she did that really confirmed I needed to interview her was the most recent ISTJ video. It's probably two or three videos ago because my wife's an ISTJ and I was like, let's see what she knows and she nailed it. And there are some personalities that conceptually understand type. They could talk about it, but they don't know them. So you're like, oh, that, that's just like a, she understands the literature around ISTJs, but Alexis actually knew it. So I was like, all right, let's, I really want to talk to her. So also, if you guys have noticed her, her thumbnail game is just great. <laughs> Thumbnails are excellent. I was like, I have to click, you know, that's, that's what you want. So great job there. So Alexis, thanks for, for joining me. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. So um, you talk about getting things done, motivation, how to structure your day. A lot of your videos aren't just about the types. It's like also just like how to set up a system for yourself. So specific to the INTJ, I want to talk about the kind of, I've experienced this, these cycles of lack of motivation. So I want to know how you deal with lack of motivation as an INTJ and then how other INTJs can kind of get out of that negative cycle and, and get motivated again. So I feel like I've noticed a cycle within myself where cycle and, and get motivated again. So I feel like I've noticed a cycle within myself where I lack of motivation. So I want to know how you deal with lack of motivation as an INTJ and then how other INTJs can kind of get out of that negative cycle and, and get motivated again. So I feel like I've noticed a cycle within myself where I um, am extremely productive for three weeks. So like on my YouTube channel, you'll see like three, four videos coming out per week for three weeks. Um, and then I just hit a crash. Um, and I think what that is, is not using TE, extroverted thinking in a sustainable way. I think sometimes with TE and FI, I can go and bursts with them. So I try really consciously to work on TE for a while. And then after, after a little bit of doing that, it's like introversion creeps back up on me. And it's like, nope, you're not going to do that. We're going to actually get in a loop. And I will tend to then for that next week, get into introverted feeling. The first couple days, I'm just kind of SE exhausted, I would say. Mm -hmm. So there's like, I've literally just exhausted myself from all the physical work. Hmm. And then after two or three days of falling off the train, I feel like ashamed. I'm like, oh, I'm not being productive. And FI will really start whispering at me, like, you need to be more productive. And that really is just the nail in the coffin that can make it go on for what would have been maybe a two day break turns into maybe a two week break. I've on YouTube even taken a two month break where I'm just sitting there trying to force myself to get back into it. And I, you know, if I couple TE and SE together, I can get stuff done, but I have to be very um, motivated and disciplined to get myself to do that. And so I think, um, so I think part of it is just from overusing TE and SE for those few weeks and just pushing myself too hard. Like I want to stretch myself, but I think, you know, there are boundaries and you want to do some things, things that are in the appropriate level of difficulty. Okay. So are you an advocate for like accepting that you're burnt out and then just taking as much time as you need or feel, or is it more like, don't let yourself get burnt out because then you're going to go on this massive, like two month gap of feeling bad about yourself and then feeling guilty or what's the strategy? Yeah, I think the strategy is probably, um, moderation <laughs> and, you know, I, you know, what I've done in the past is I have just like, I'll just let myself mope, I guess for me, if I can be a lot of moping and I have just let myself completely tank. And after doing that enough times, I think after doing YouTube for about a year now, I think I'm at the point where I'm like, okay, I need to, <laughs> this is what's going to happen. We see the pattern repeating itself with this exhaustion. And so, um, we're not going to do this anymore. Um, but yeah, I would just say that for me, it's doing things in moderation and setting up I'm trying to work on setting up better TE systems because sometimes for the first week I'll set a system in place and then the next week I'll say, okay, well, that was that week of YouTube content batching. How can we make it better? So the next mm -hmm. week I'll make it better and add in more details. The third week I'll add even more details and it's like this FI perfectionism ideal standard and what I was doing week one, I could sustain, but because I keep 
with my introverted processes kind of perfecting it. It just is like, I try to convince myself done is better than perfect, but I, if I keep perfecting it, it won't get done. Okay. So you do the, I think you said content batching. So you'll crank out a certain amount of content in a very specific amount of time and then release it. Yeah. So That's I, smart. That's good. Yeah. So I'll film like three videos in one day. And then over the next three days, I edit each of those. So what do you want people to get from your channel? Like what's the goal if you can tell people? Two years ago, I got a breast lump and it took mm. them like six months to figure out what it was. Um, and they were like, oh, you're so young. Don't worry about it. And then there'd be, they'd be like, oh, shoot, that looks really bad. And I'd have another appointment and they're like, oh, you're young. Don't worry about it. And then they're like, oh, shoot. And so it was just kind of a series of these um, kind of like disappointing appointments. And then it turned out to all be fine. Like there was no issue. It was fine. It was like some scar tissue, random stuff. But it was, it's significant. It's pretty large. And it's like, I don't know. I can't know if you can see, but it's pretty big. Um, so from that experience and then with COVID piggybacking, that was like three months later, COVID happened. And just with all that, I decided that I don't um, want to do something that I don't love. I was teaching math at the time and mm -hmm. I enjoyed math, but I didn't enjoy teaching. And I kind of decided that I don't want anyone else to be making that mistake. I don't want anyone else to be in a career that they don't love. And I'm very career oriented, but just in general, I want people to do what they're passionate about. Right. Like just pick the one thing and do it because... I was kind of banking on 83 years and you know you might not have it and so i want people to um, understand what their strengths are um, and be able to manage their weaknesses um, and have the bravery to go out there i'm pretty passionate about introverts specifically i think sometimes they don't have enough courage to get out there and do the thing but i just think when you have introverts who spend a lot of time alone getting clarity about things if they could just get out there and get out of their comfort zone they would have like really big impact and i'm passionate about you know extroverts doing the same thing but because i'm an introvert i'm really passionate about mm -hmm. you know introverts being bold right. um and so i did some personality content originally on my channel then i did some general personal development content so my plan is to right now niche down and have a very specific niche and then mm. ride that for a year or two longer and i don't think i'll ever stop doing personality content but i i really would like to get into the more general stuff that you need to be a bigger content creator for it to do well yeah i agree there are there it's interesting when people in the community get really niche in terms of like like how your trickster function manifests as an isfp i'm like yeah that's good i mean but you're that's why you would get like 900 views is because it's like i mean that's not exactly a topic we're all searching for but there is so much of that out there so it's like how popular can you get in personality i mean there's a couple of examples of some pretty popular people but um yeah i guess personal development personality type there might be like a real chance to blow up there possibly yeah i think with personality or with any niche in general it's important to uh, market toward beginners when you look at the people like Frank James, people doing well in the personality space, they marketed toward beginners. And the people right. that cap out at like 5,000 subscribers are the ones who are talking about like maybe the bottom four functions and right. very niche stuff. So even cognitive functions is really putting a cap on what you can do, but then there's Love Who, who I think is about 100,000 subscribers, so. Um, He's great, yeah. He's figured yeah. out like the perfect blend of not getting too in depth, but still like being relatable. And I think right. Dear Kristen's a good example of someone that's coming up right. and it's like very skit oriented, clearly knows the cognitive functions, clearly knows, how, but like not talking about them too much where you right. lose the beginner. I'm somebody, and I'm sure you're the same way, that once you sort of get into type and really understanding it, there was not a situation where you could not see type from like, what type is this country is that globally <laughs> to like right. every single niche topic oh that's just like that manifestation so where does type just not apply if if there's any like in hiring like is it ethical to hire people based on type <laughs> <laughs> so that's one. i mean that's one area yeah that i don't have my like fully formed thoughts on i would say it's debatable um but i can't think of any i'm sure that there are areas where type does not apply um i can't think of anything off the top of my head maybe like I'm just, I'm not even trying to preface or prompt you, but like mental illness in type, can we go like autism in type? Is that oh, sure. totally outside of where you can't, there's no type, you can't, you can't type somebody even using like an EEG machine if they have some sort of mental illness or some neuro neurodivergent, maybe. 
You know, I think if people are on, if people are heavily medicated, that would make it very difficult for the outside observer to type. I see. Um, maybe, um, I don't even know. I mean, maybe there are some people that have extremely low IQs. I don't know oh, how much yeah. of that is just brain damage and if that would affect things. Um, I'm kind of unclear um, how much I think is like nature versus nurture. Like right. are you just born with this type? Does it not develop till you're 10, 15? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm kind of unclear about, you know, the nature versus nurture part. So I think that would affect the way I would answer. Okay. And I guess the fact that, um, and maybe you'll think of an answer later and do a video on it or something, but I think the fact that it wasn't apparently clear to me is sort of like, it's, it's everywhere. It like pervades in all sort of interactions you have and all sort of entertainment people you deal with. It's like, oh, that's, that's that. It's like, wow, it's everywhere, I guess. And I may, right. it may not be, you may not be able to apply other systems. I mean, I definitely, I mean, there are lots of places I see it. Like I even think of it with um, branding. You know, I look at like this company's branding is very TE. Oh, this yeah. company's branding, or I'll go to churches and I'm like, this is a very FI church. This is a very <laughs> FE church or an SI. Love it. I mean, and so I look at organizations all the time. Well, FE is the most easiest, is what everyone's doing for marketing now. FE oh, do you so think fun. so? Really? When I was talking to Gabe at Rational Typology, he was like, politics and marketing is all FE. Like if you have FE high up, it's very easy to be successful as a person. And then just like either personal marketing, personal branding, we're all in this together is a very popular, like across the world as, as a company. If you can add that to your image, it's easy to win. As a, as an INTJ, like what do you look for? And I guess we can break into two categories, be like friendships and then like romance spouse, long-term partner. Or maybe they're the same thing. Yeah, I think I definitely have like a type. If you think about like like a personality type and like what I look for, like I think in relationships, I just love NPs. Any of the NPs, I really enjoy any of the NE users. Um, you know, there are different things that I like for. Like I find ENTPs really charming and charismatic. Mm, I love them. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I, I find. Do. I find INTPs really fun to have conversations with. I feel like it's similar to an ENTP, but you can get deeper on it. Um, they're a little less charismatic, but I feel like you can get deeper on things. Um, I like INFPs. I like IFPs actually just a lot. Like I would marry an INFP. I'd marry an INFP and have an ESFP best friend. <laughs> Wait, did I say, did I misspeak? I would, I would marry no, an INFP. No. What and have an ESFP friend? best friend. No, not an ESFP best friend. I didn't. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'd marry an INFP and have an ENTP best friend. I totally see that, yes. Yeah. I feel like the thing... I, I almost put ENTPs as my favorite type, except for I don't trust them a lot of the time. It's very hard for me to find an ENTP that I trust. <laughs> Even if they're, you know, a great person... I still just have a hard time trusting them. Yeah, I kind of feel like when I look around at married couples and I'm typing them, the most common there's not there's not as common trends. Maybe mm, the most the most common pattern that I see is it'll be two people that have the same judging function axis but reversed. So you'll have like a TI user with an FE user, um, and then so they'll have the same judging axis, and then their perceiving axis will be different. So one's got like SE and one has SI. So I see yeah. like ISFJs and ESTPs a lot, or just SFJs with, e with STPs in general. Okay. So I feel like, so for INTJs, that makes sense. So like we've got TE, so I would like some with the FI. And then if you take the different judging axis, or I mean the different perceiving axis, for me, that's NI. So for them, that'd be NE. So that's where you like liking ENFPs and INFPs. Oh, okay. And I noticed that pattern more strongly for some reason with FE and TI users. Like I find FPs, uh, or I notice FPs in a relationship with a lot of different people, but mm. FJs and TPs is a very common pairing. There's a more strong pattern. Interesting. There. So my wife's an ISTJ. I'm INTJ. Um, I actually believe it or not, have not looked into the romantic types that much in terms of like how they get along. So in your professional opinion, 
does that just if you didn't know that and you just said oh these two people are dating and you said like oh how is the date gonna go would you say gonna go terribly or it's like oh, that could be interesting what would you say i mean it could be interesting I, I have some istj friends i mean on the negative side i would say it could be boring like worst case scenario it's boring and you're quiet especially on a first date i think that SJs, um, in my opinion, get better as the years go on. So if you've known them for 40 years, I think SJs get better with time. But as far as the first date, you got an introvert with another introvert, <laughs> both, I, both IJs, which are some of the most introverted. So yeah, I would say boring. But eventually, I would think that you could get very deep conversations. Okay. It'd be a very productive relationship. It'd be a very utilitarian relationship. Like. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> get things done, maybe. But oh yeah, okay. It might be. It might be lacking fun. That could be. Yeah, I could see that. Um, and I think like the perception would be like, you guys like, what are you doing? You're, like the my first date was I took her. Well, the first half of the date was at a bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. But that was like a test because I wanted to see like if she would be cool with me and my natural element, which is a bookstore, or if she's gonna be like, ooh, this is boring like books, but she wasn't. So I was like, all right, a little win there. Then a music store after that. So I was like, okay, we're, we're doing okay. What kind okay of books here. do you like? I like, like political and not, well, political nonfiction. I used to read a lot of like horror books, but now I sprinkle it in just to get, just to stay, just for fun. Fiction is so easy to read. Like you can crank through that. Nonfiction is just, I like, I like having as much information as possible because you just yeah. never know when you're going to need it. You never know. Yeah, I almost exclusively read nonfiction. It's so interesting that you say you can crank through fiction. I do not crank through fiction. I crank through nonfiction. I just pile through nonfiction. That's I so really cool. Like what? Like business books. Like what do I have on my shelf? Fix this next. Uh, when thinking fast and slow. Okay. Um, the Art of Logic. It's a lot of personal development books. It's mm -hmm. like personal development and business books. That's a great topic. And I think that's, I think the thing that is tough, I, I think I may have said this before to you in pre-show or something like that, but it's written by TE users. I think. Right. Like, yeah, tons of business books. 90%. Books. So, yes. So <laughs> I feel like with me wanting to develop TE, the first place I went was... Well, I was always just like reading personal development books, but then I started consciously like reading business books for personal development. And I, <laughs> that's the most introverted way you could possibly go about trying to develop TE, but that was like my first step. <laughs> what, reading business books? Yeah. Totally. I mean, I mean, it was like, in my mind, I was like, yeah, I'm working on TE, but I'm still alone in my house reading a book. Like I could have been out there starting a project, leading people, managing people, getting stuff done, but I was still at home reading a book. <laughs> There's this huge gulf, the big divide between like when I, I had actually like right when I was like probably 20, I'm 31 now, but like 22, 23, I'd asked like a, a fairly successful business friend of mine, like, what books should I read to kind of understand? He's like, don't read any books, just go out and do it. And for me, I was like, that's horrifying. Like I need to get some background. And so I think you did you did what INTJs would do is like, I need a conceptual version, maybe read about famous business people and what they did, how they kind of started. But like the people that go out and do it, that like the ESTP entrepreneur type that like doesn't have the background knowledge, but has like the charisma and the SE dominant personality to do it, tends to get ahead in society, I think. I mean, the best advice for INTJs is I think to stop with analysis paralysis. Like once I got out of the books, um, which I still, I mean, I haven't gotten out of the books, but <laughs> I'm out a lot more than I used to. I used to go to Barnes and Noble and read a book a day. Oh my God. So, Amazing. I mean, I'm doing a lot better than I used to. I'm